decide to go into executive session and conceal the people's business, they have chosen to do it. We need to send that message. Every single time they do it, they have conscientiously chosen to conceal the public's business. Now, I'm not saying that there are not times that that's a good choice to make. If, for instance, there is a potentially embarrassing or hurtful situation involving a <coughs> personnel matter in local government that might, for instance, damage somebody's children or hurt somebody on a personal level, it would seem reasonable that local officials would discuss the contents of that embarrassing information outside of the public view. But it's still a choice. It's still a choice they're making. If, in fact, somebody has their hand in the teal, somebody is taking money that belongs to me and you, I don't want you going behind executive, uh, concealing yourself in executive session and disclosing that information. I want to know about it. And I ought to know about it because it's my money that somebody's been taking. If, in fact, and here's the, here's, the, here's the thing that drives me crazy about real estate transactions. Everybody says the same thing about real estate transactions. We might compromise a deal if we talked about it out and open. <laughs> really? I wonder how many times that's actually happened. Yes, a bad open meetings law gives them the ability to talk about a real estate transaction. It doesn't require them to. And I actually think if you talked about it out in the open, you might sweep the pot a little bit. You know? I, I, and I'm not saying it would go that way, but it may very well be by being more transparent and open about these real estate transactions, they can actually boister the public's position in a real estate transaction. Because who are they buying that property for? What is government? It's us. So they're buying that property for me, but I can't know about it. They're buying that property for me, but I can't know until after they've already bought it. Yeah, they have to take the vote in public, but all the negotiations are going on behind closed doors. How many of y'all would buy a house or a piece of property and not know any of the terms of the deal until you went into closing to sign the paperwork? So yes, they can. But my point is, they don't have to. And do you know that not every state allows real estate transactions to take place behind closed doors? Every state doesn't allow it. So here's the thing. If you can buy property and sell property and lease property in other states and do it all out in the open and it work, why won't it work in Georgia? It's usually who they're buying from, not what they're buying. <laughs> <laughs> and how much you're paying for those relatives. <laughs> well, again, I hope you take away all your blogs and in your websites and on the front pages of your newspapers or at the very least on the editorial page. You can let people know that it's not a requirement. There is not a requirement in the law. And, uh, you know, I honestly do believe what I'm telling you. And that is that this uh, chairman of the Board of Education 100% believed that she was required to go into executive session. She 100% believed that that was what she had to do. And I'm going to tell you, why she believed that? Her attorney told her. <laughs> One of your biggest enemies are going to be government lawyers. <laughs> it is their intent <coughs> to keep their clients out of trouble. My argument is you're their clients. They're working for you. And that's one reason, and I, I, I run afoul of, of, of all of my, my legal friends when I say this, but that's one reason I don't really buy this whole attorney-client privilege thing. I am the client. <coughs> you are the client. Government is not something other than the people. Government is the people. The second thing that I want you to understand is that there is no prohibition.
I cannot tell you the number of times that I've gone to a member of county commission or to a chairman or to a mayor or to a city councilman and said, hey, help me out here. Tell me what y'all are talking about behind closed doors. And be told, Jim, I can't tell you, I'm not allowed to. I'd be in trouble. I'd run afoul of the law. I'd be breaking the law if I told you. I'd be breaking the law if I told you what we talked about in executive session. What I want you to understand is there is no prohibition. Our friend David Hudson, I think fired a shot across the bow last year. And he made some public comments and conducted some interviews uh, that uh, we popularized, it probably did more than anything else really to, to grow and, and to put the transparency project, project on the map. And we had newspapers all across the state uh, of Georgia pick it up and uh, had people call in to write and left want to know about it. Uh, uh, Sean Ireland at Georgia Press uh, picked it up and, and uh, Sean said that very few things that Georgia Press had ever pushed out had ever gotten as much attention as this comment from David Hudson. And David said that the problem is that too many of public officials understand, misunderstand 4510 And basically what that law says is, is that a public official cannot divulge proprietary information or divulge information for personal gain. And David said, at what point can a local code of ethics at what point could an affidavit, or what, at what point could your relationship to a commission or a council upon which you sit circumvent your First Amendment rights? Now, for a long time, I had a hard time understanding the relationship between the First Amendment and government transparency. And it always amused me because people a lot of times speak about the First Amendment, our freedom of the press and our freedom of speech and our freedom of religion and our right to peaceably assemble and to address <coughs> government for a redress of our group, petition government for redress of our grievances. And I thought, well, you know, we, we call freedom of information and government transparency the same thing. But this is one way that they are inextricably tied together. And that is just because somebody talked about something in the executive session behind closed doors making a backroom deal does not mean if they believe it is in the public interest that they are somehow muzzled and cannot speak to you to me to the media or to anyone else there is no sort of giving up of one's First Amendment rights simply by virtue of the fact that they sit on a county commission or that they sit on a city council. Now, good luck getting somebody to break ranks. Right? Good luck getting a commissioner willing to come out and say, okay, Jim, I'm going to tell you what. I don't agree with what they did in there, and I'm going to spill the beans. But there are good people out there that believe in right things. And maybe all of us can work really harder to build relationships with government. So that every contact that we have with government is not adversarial. Every conversation that we have with a commissioner or with a council member is not combative. Because eventually somebody's going to do it. The very chairman that said to me, Jim, I legally can't tell you what happened, busted a case wide open in Henry County based on information that he shared about things that were going on behind closed doors that were done dirty. And here's the other question about it. How can somebody be legally prohibited from talking about something that goes on in executive session that is not legally privileged? And if you don't think that they're talking about things behind closed doors that they are not legally allowed to, you're naive because they don't.
because they interpret the law in the broadest way possible. The state of Georgia says that the presumption should always be toward openness. And you can take those words any way you want to. Here's what I think that means. And our lawyer can tell us whether or not she agrees with this. I think that means that the law should be interpreted as narrowly as possible. I don't agree with, it, with, it, with our executive session privilege, obviously. But it should be interpreted as narrowly as possible. Uh, a couple of months ago, I visited with Mr. Owens, and I've got uh, a meeting with him um, on the 31st, on Halloween of all days. <laughs> I've got a meeting with him scheduled on the 31st. And uh, when we last broached this subject together, I told him, I really think that we need to open up the discussion about executive session in Georgia. His response was, Jim, the climate in our General Assembly is fragile. And we don't want to open up this door. I disagree. The best offense is not a strong defense. The best defense is a strong offense. Open government advocates and the media need to advocate for ordinary people. And that's what this is about. And listen, if you think open government laws, if you think sunshine laws exist for the sake of the media, you're sorely mistaken. This is not a newspaper issue. It's not a media issue. This should be about the rights of ordinary citizens and their access to govern. And the third thing that I want you to know is that there is no protection that is afforded just because a lawyer happens to be in the room. There is no protection that is provided local officials that is automatically triggered by the presence of their lawyer. The legal privilege says that they can go into executive session to discuss matters of pending or real litigation. That doesn't mean that somebody might sue us if something might happen. As a matter of fact, Stefan Ritter even uh, said uh, in a session at, at, at uh, the Georgia Press Education Center in Atlanta last year that he believes that that means that there must actually be a filed lawsuit or a letter of intent to file a lawsuit. So that there has to be some kind, there has to be some piece of paper that suggests that a lawsuit exists or is it about to exist, that the mere threat of a lawsuit or the concept of being sued is not enough. So that it is to be that narrowly interpreted. Listen, that wasn't, uh, with, with all due respect to uh, Assistant A.G. Ritter, uh, that wasn't from an open government advocate. That was from government. And we need to understand that it is not up to the AG or to the DA or to Holly or Jim. It's up to all of us as citizens of the state of Georgia that government belongs to us. So there is no automatic protection. Uh, I uh, uh, talked to a, a, a former mayor a few months ago, and he told me about one uh, lawyer uh, that served, I think, at one time, six different municipalities in North Georgia. And I don't know what else he did, but he served six different municipalities as their city lawyer. And uh, I won't tell you his name, but uh, his initials are Steve Fincher. <laughs> and he said, Jim, I promise you that Attorney Fincher told the Hampton City Council, uh, Joe Adji back here is from Hampton, he said he told the Hampton City Council, y'all can talk about anything you want to as long as I'm in the room. Mm -hmm. No, that is not what the exception allows. There's no automatic umbrella that is triggered by the presence <clears throat> of the attorney. Can I have that envelope? Yes. Did you read it? Thank you. This is mine now. Why did you give this to me? Because it, it's yours. Because you, you, you own it. It was like a lost set of keys to me. 
Uh, all the piece of paper uh, said is, is this is Jim's paper. We need to stop begging the government. How easy was that? You know why she gave it to me? Because she understood it was my property. And she has integrity. <laughs> and she has integrity. Well, we, we allegedly. <laughs> We are only asking government for things that belong to us. When you ask for a document, you're not asking government to give you their property. You're asking them to hand back to you your property that they're taking care of for you. Do you understand that concept? Now, Sam Allen says that. He does have to oh, have that. But I'm going to tell you, he's not alone. But that's the culture that we have got to incubate with our county, with our city, with our Board of Education. We're not going in there demanding something that belongs to them. We're just asking them, can you give me my papers back? Because we own the papers. When we want to know what goes on behind closed doors, we're not asking them to tell us something that belongs to them. We're asking them what they're doing for us because they're spending our money. They're making our decisions for us. Ours is a representative form of government. We do not elect officials to think for us. We elect them to represent us. And there's a big difference there. They are there to do our bidding. I don't think we have done a good job. You see, it's easy to blame the, the newspaper. And believe me, I'll put a lot of blame on newspapers. <laughs> Uh, it's easy to blame the newspapers because they haven't been watchdogs. And I'm going to tell you, the newspapers in Georgia are not good watchdogs. Newsflash. <coughs> we are not great at it anymore. We have left our mission of being the fourth estate. Let's just take ownership of it and admit it. We're not great watchdogs anymore like we used to be. But let's stop blaming the newspapers. And let's stop blaming county commissioners and stop blaming city council and stop blaming AGs and stop blaming DAs and stop blaming records custodians and put the blame where it belongs and it's square on our shoulders. Because we have not incubated an environment where there is the expectation of openness. Now, I say we in a very broad way. Some of you are doing that. But you are minuscule compared to our communities. When we build a culture and environment across the state of Georgia, in a sense, it's ours. It belongs to us. And we go into records custom. You know the one of the worst things you can do? Hey, can, can you imagine driving up to the drive-thru at McDonald's? and say, I want my hamburger, I want it now, and I'm telling you I'm not going to wait five minutes for my hamburger. You put my hamburger here right now, and I don't want it to be cold. I'm telling you, give me my hamburger right now. Who wants to eat that burger when it comes out of the <laughs> <laughs> But that's the way we treat government. I'm going to tell you how, and Holly and I probably disagree on this, I'm going to tell you how I think your first records request should always happen. Here's why I think every records request should begin. Hey, can I have that for a second? Thank you. I think that's where we ought to do it. We ought to be friendly. We ought to be nice. We're human beings. And you know what records custodians are? Believe it or not, they're folks. They're people. They're men and women. They're moms and dads. They're, they're brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles. They're in-laws and outlaws. <laughs> Some of them are outlaws. Just a few. But let's just treat them with human dignity. And let's assume that they get it instead of assuming that they don't. Now, when they don't get it, then we need to make that formal records request and we need to build a paper trail. But the first time you really don't. The first time you really don't. The first time you just need to say, you know what? I was wanting the meetings from last night and I didn't get them. Could you give me those meetings? Or those minutes from that meeting? It's not casual because all you're doing, all you're doing is asking them for what's yours anyway. And for the stuff they're doing in executive session, I don't want to 
in there and just stomp and, and rant and rave and holler and just say, what in the world are y'all doing back there so long? I'll tell you just one quick story, and then we're going to break. A uh, great, great, great reporter friend of mine was uh, working in a case that involved a lot of open records and was getting very, very frustrated because the records were being denied. They were being stalled. They were, the, 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 what's the standard response? We have no records no that records are... No records responsive to your request. That was it. I mean, she kept, kept hearing that over and over and over again. And uh, I was getting very, very frustrated. Came into my office and, you know, uh, saying uh, expletives that we don't print in newspapers and uh, getting very, very animated. And I was like, okay, let's, let's just sort of work through this, okay? So I picked up my cell phone and I called the cell phone of the county manager. And I said, hey, Tommy. I understand there's an investigative file sitting on your desk. Could you get that over to me? He's like, Jim, get ready to go for lunch. I'll bring it over right now. It wasn't a battle for him. But his office and his records custody had stalled and or denied the record over a long period of time. I'm not saying that there should be an abracadabra, because there shouldn't be. There should not be any hoops that you got to jump through. There shouldn't be because I'm the editor of the newspaper, I've got weight. Or because Kelly, hot Kelly, <laughs> because my close and lovely friend Holly can write an amazing letter and has some weight coming from the First Amendment Foundation or because I can call representing the Transparency Project that we could access that record for you. It shouldn't be that way. And it shouldn't be that I have to be nice to get anything from God. But at the end of the day, our goal is not to say gotcha. Our goal is to get the record. To get access to me and to hold government accountable. Okay. Um,